Welcome to worship on this Maundy Thursday, the evening that we gather to honor the Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples during Holy Week. This evening's service is an opportunity not only to partake in communion together, but to retell the story of the betrayal of Jesus. So as our service unfolds this evening, the sanctuary lights will be dimmed, the service will get quieter, you'll find that you're sitting more often than standing during the service, and when the service does finally conclude, we ask that you depart in silence out to the parking lot as you head home in the darkness this evening. Our service will also conclude with the singing of a hymn, and as you may remember if you've joined us for the service before, in between each verse of that hymn, there'll be a minute or two of silence in which some members who've been pre-selected from the congregation will come forward and do what is called strip the sanctuary of its decorations. So by the time we're done, at the end of our service, the sanctuary will be bare in preparation for the darkness that we encounter when we are together tomorrow at noon for worship on Good Friday. In honor of Holy Week, we gathered to worship on Palm Sunday, waving our palms of praise this past weekend. We gather tonight at the Lord's table. Tomorrow at noon, there'll be a service here that'll be focused on prayer and scripture. We encourage you to attend that as well. And then you have two opportunities to worship with us on Sunday morning. A sunrise service at 6.30 a.m. and another service at 10.30 a.m. And this year, the 6.30 service, because Easter is falling in March when it's a bit colder outside, the 6.30 service will also be held indoors. We have encouraged and invited those members of neighboring Presbyterian churches to join us, and we have advertised many of their services to you as well. So I'm hoping based on your work and family and household schedules over the next few days, you have the opportunity to avail yourself of either worship with us here in Elmas Park or at our neighboring congregations. As we traditionally do, we are also recording our worship service for later online broadcasts for those who may be worshiping with us from home. This evening, as we come to this time of worship, I invite you to stand with me for our call to worship. Please join me responsibly. On this day, Christ the Lamb of God gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him. On this day, Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room. On this day, Christ took a towel and washed his disciples' feet, giving us an example that we should do to others as he has done for us. On this day, Christ our God gave us this holy feast that we who eat this bread and drink this cup may here proclaim his holy sacrifice and be partakers of his resurrection, and that last day we reign with him in heaven. Let's lift our voices together in song. <coughs>
reconciliation, seeking forgiveness, seeking grace, and acknowledging our need for a savior, we first come before God in prayer, praying together in one voice, and then in the silence of our hearts, asking for God's forgiveness. Please join me in unison as we pray our prayer of confession. Eternal God, whose covenant with us is never broken, we confess that we fail to fulfill your will. Though you have bound yourself to us, we will not bind ourselves to you. In Jesus Christ, you serve us freely, but we refuse your love and withhold ourselves from others. We do not love you fully or love one another as you command. In your mercy, forgive and cleanse us. Lead us once again to your table and unite us to Christ, who is the bread of life and the vine from which you grow in grace. Lord, have mercy. And believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As we join our voices with Christians over generations and across the globe, we use the words that are familiar to us to affirm our faith in our triune God. Join me now as we declare what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the light of everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we turn to scripture tonight to hear once again the account of Jesus gathering with his disciples, of changing their understanding of their relationship from that moment moving forward, we look back at how scripture had prepared the chosen people of God to receive their Savior. How over generations, people through praise and lament through acts of liturgy and a form of worship, as well as just crying out in joy and thanksgiving, as well as in times of need, spoke to God. The words of scripture are not only the living word of God, but the words that people use to speak to our living God. So as we turn to scripture this evening, please first join me in prayer. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we are grateful for the gift of your word. As we open scripture, and hear an account that may be familiar to us. Let us also hear it afresh and anew. As we open the words written during the time of King David, may the psalm lift our heart and spirit to you. As we open a gospel account, seeking to better understand your will and your truth and your message to us, may your Holy Spirit speak to us. Guide us to keep this gospel message in our heart and when appropriate to share it through words and actions in response to a world that needs a savior. May these words bring us comfort, may they speak your truth, may they reaffirm our faith, and may they guide us into a future filled with your hope at the fulfillment of your promised return at a day yet to be known. We thank you for all that you fulfilled in scripture and we look forward to continuing to see you at work in our lives, in our world, and the history, the present, and the future of your people. We ask now for the presence of your spirit that we may hear you speak. We ask this all giving thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. This evening, I invite you to hear these words written in the time of King David from Psalm 116. If you would like to read along with me, it's on page 605. 
These are words written to be used in worship, set to music that now has been lost to history, but words of poetry now that declare the psalmist's affirmation of their faith in the one true God. So hear these words in Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, O oh my soul. For the Lord has been good to you. For you, O oh Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I said, I am greatly afflicted. And in my dismay I said, all men are liars. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. <coughs> I invite you now to remain seated as we lift our voices and prayerfully sing the song, Ah, Holy Jesus.
Gospel of John, chapter 13, beginning with the first verse. And if you'd like to read along with me, it's page 1066. All four Gospels tell an account of what we now recognize as Holy Thursday or Maundy Thursday. Here now with the Gospel of John recounts for us. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, Jesus now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So Jesus got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered him, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For Jesus knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, Jesus gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast, 
or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. So there's clearly something missing from this account. When we read the Gospel of John, it's noticeable that the focus is not on the institution of the Lord's Supper, a sacrament in our tradition, the climax, often, of our worship services together, a reason we make specific time and insistence in our life to be present on communion Sundays or special worship services where we're invited to the Lord's table, an integral part of our faith is breaking the bread and sharing the cup. Yet for the Gospel of John, that is not the primary focus of remembering this evening's events. Overshadowing the meal itself is this betrayal from Judas, the conflict and confusion amongst the disciples, and the introduction and reoccurrence of an unnamed disciple known as the one whom Jesus loved. Now, most theologians, theologians and scholars believe that the one whom Jesus loved is John, the author of this gospel, who in an act almost of humility never names himself because he maybe feels uncomfortable about the way Jesus has asked him to step out of the other 12 and have a special role at this meal. Later on in our Holy Week accounts, we will have the disciple whom Jesus loved, present at the empty tomb, again, unnamed, but described. The Gospel of John focuses on this meal, the betrayal, and the confusion of the disciples to not fully understand what is happening, even when Jesus tells them time and time again what is transpiring, and tells them that I'm telling you so that when it happens you will understand, they're still left perplexed. Yet this gospel circles back time and time again to this foundational love that Jesus has for his disciples. For the fact that at that meal, the one who's going to betray him to the point of death is still welcome. At that meal, Judas receives the chunk of bread that Jesus as the host offers to his guests. In the Jewish tradition, when a host has a meal, it's an honor to be the first one to be served by the host at the table. So they're eating in a family-style meal, platters of food, and if the host stands and hands you the food first, you are the guest of honor. Jesus again turns expectations on his head when he says, the first person I serve is actually the one who's going to betray me. The first one I serve could not actually be honorable, but history will say is dishonorable. Now this seems like the opposite of what one should do, but it doesn't appear as opposite in the flow of how this gospel account tells the story of this meal. Because the host sharing the favored dish, the first portion of the best fruits of this meal with the one who would betray him has happened after Jesus has humbled himself and washed his disciples' feet. Another act of role reversal, of not doing what people expect, of humbling oneself to do the most unpleasant, unfavored task in a household, something the lowest level servant or the youngest, most immature person in the room would do. He is modeling time and time again in this meal about how he is a servant. And he tells them more than once that I'm doing these things as a model so that you will continue to do them, so that you will continue to serve, so that you will continue to reciprocate service to one another, so that you will continue in humility to not always need to be the first or the primary or the most important. And thankfully, it appears that lesson was learned. Because when John, the author of this gospel, recounts the events, in humility, he leaves himself unnamed. 
It's simply the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, Scripture tells us that Jesus loved all of his disciples. In fact, in some traditions, coming to the table is called a love feast. This is an invitation to be in direct agape or fellowship love with one another and with Jesus. So all of us who come to this table are the disciples whom Jesus loves. Anyone could be that disciple who's sitting right next to Jesus, who's speaking on behalf of the other disciples, inquiring to Jesus what he means and sharing their doubts and confusion. And as the events unfold over the next several days, any one of us could be the disciple whom Jesus loves, who runs towards the tomb, who discovers it empty, who's left baffled by this discovery. The disciples, time and time again, are told the truth, they witness the truth, they experience the truth, and then scripture tells us that they did not yet understand that truth. We, as present-day disciples, those whom Jesus loves, come to this table repeatedly, come to this table often in our faith journey, in our journeys of discipleship, whether that be that we approach it for the first time, or the hundredth time, or the thousandth time. We keep coming because there's still more to understand, more to unpack. There are doubts and fears and hesitations to wrestle with. We are questioning. Am I the disciple whom Jesus loves? Or am I the disciple who gives into temptation and somehow betrays my Lord? Can I be both simultaneously? In different times of my faith journey, can I be John and other times be Judas? Or in this account, can I fall somewhere in between and be Simon Peter, who fluctuates from wanting to please Jesus and obey Jesus to protesting whenever Jesus does something outside the bounds of his expectations. Peter famously, throughout all the gospel accounts, is very vocal as a disciple who wants Jesus to say, good job, my faithful servant. So his response always to Jesus is, what can I do to please you, to satisfy you, to get that pat on the back that I've done it correct? Jesus is wrestling with these three discipleship identities. Even in this meal, this Passover meal with his disciples, what we now call the Last Supper, he's wrestling with the fact that some of his disciples are protesting what's going to happen. Others are wrestling with the fact that they have no idea what is going on and they're confused and doubtful. Others are trying to be obedient, and yet one is giving into the greatest temptation. This room of those who've been called to follow Jesus, to witness the miracles, to hear him preach, to encounter people he has healed and people he's raised from the dead, to witness the debate and the friction he has with institutional leaders, to see how he stands his ground in the face of doubters and haters and those who are afraid of him, to see how he confidently and without hesitation stands firm in his faith and proclamation, no matter if he encounters people who praise him or people who mock him. The disciples are wrestling with all of this and digesting it in real time. Without the gift of hindsight and study and generations of faithful that you and I have, they are the primary eyewitnesses, the first ones to hear, see, touch, feel, and experience all of this. And our grace-filled Lord is saying, no matter how you respond, no matter how you process this, no matter how you present yourself at this table and partaking in this meal, you are welcome here no matter what you bring to the table. Whether you are afraid, whether you are hesitant, whether you are doubting your identity as a follower of Jesus, whether you like to think of yourself as the one who is loved by our Lord, or whether you know and can admit to yourself that at least once, if not multiple times, you have betrayed your Lord. All of you are welcome at this table. The meal itself is not the focus to John. For John's gospel, the focus is the welcome, the love, the acknowledgement of that mixed bag of people who are bringing different emotions and understandings, levels of engagement, 
those who have all the same information, who have witnessed all the same events, who have followed Jesus now for three years and heard every question, every denial, every accusation, every word of praise, are now processing all of this. And the events that will unfold between this evening and Easter morning are actually going to go by extremely fast for these individuals. Three years of preparation now crammed into Thursday evening through Sunday morning for fulfillment of all that's been promised. <coughs> it's a lot to process. It's a lot to digest. And when they lift up, that they are a bit confused, that they are filled with doubt, that there's some hesitation and fear, Jesus responds to them and says, I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to testify to what's happening and tell you and prepare you. I'm going to state that I know who my betrayer is and call him out in front of his brothers right here. And then I'm going to willingly go through with the difficult task that lies ahead. And I'm also going to share this meal with you which is an act of liturgy and worship in our faith tradition, which remembers and honors what God has done for the faithful in the past, which shows that God will intervene to save us, which reaffirms our identity as the chosen people of God. And Jesus says, I will do all of this for you and with you because I love you. All of us know what it is to love someone or be loved. To different degrees at different times in our lives that may feel different. But the one truth about love, whether it be in a family or a friendship, whether it be someone that you have long loved or someone you recently loved, love is a gift that says, I love you the way you are. I love you with your imperfections as well as the things that are challenging about you. I love you for your beauty and your wisdom. I love you for your good humor. I love you for the way you love me. I love you for the unexpected things you do as well as the highly predictable things you do. I love you sometimes in spite of yourself. I love you sometimes in spite of myself. Jesus at this meal, in service, in testimony, in proclamation, in preparation, and in the acts of worship, affirmed the identity of all of those disciples as being individuals whom he loved and will continue to love throughout the events that are going to unfold. And we know what lies ahead is not just the betrayal of Judas, but the betrayal of Peter and denying even knowing his Lord, the scattering and abandonment of the disciples who run rather than get caught up in his arrest, trial, and crucifixion, and the continued confusion and doubt and hesitancy as the truth of the resurrection unfolds. But Jesus says, I will continue to love you even through all of this pain, betrayal, confusion, doubt, and what can seem from our eyes looking at it, disappointment and somehow missing the mark and being maybe less than they were expected to be with all the preparation that had gone into these events in the three years of ministry and walking with our Lord. So as we come to this table this evening, we are called to be the disciples whom Jesus loves. Those who can sit next to him at a meal, rest our head on his shoulder, ask questions, have doubts, admit to him that we don't quite understand what's going on, but we are eager to be in his presence at table with him to witness what will happen, the good, the bad, and the indifferent, and to continue to journey with him, knowing he is preparing us, and yet it still feels like we are not fully prepared. Amen.
as you prepare this evening to come to the Lord's table. As a reminder, we'll invite you to come forward. And there's options for you to take the pre-sealed cup and wafer together, or to pick up the rice cake, which is gluten-free, or the cracker that is offered, and the juice. And then we'll ask you to proceed back to your seat. If for whatever reason you're unable to come forward and would like Catherine or I to come to you, after everyone else has come up, just raise your hand and we can bring things to you where you are seated. This evening, as we partake at the table, we'll be led in music by a duet by our choir members. I invite you, as you return to your seat, to sit and to reflect and to be in prayer, to take this opportunity to embrace the meaning of communion, to acknowledge that in this time and place, you are, yes, here as an individual, a disciple of our Lord Jesus, but you're also here gathered with your community of faith, and if you're worshiping with us from home, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, you are connected to this body of believers. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity to come to this table. You have blessed us already by the call to be your disciples. Our cup now overflows with blessing. As we come here to share the bread and the cup, may we be reminded of the amazing connection we have with the faithful. Not only the disciples who gathered in that upper room almost 2,000 years ago, but disciples who gather across the globe, across language and tradition, those who gather in places of hardship and warfare, those who gather in places where they are persecuted for their faith, those who gather in large cathedrals, those who worship from home, those who may be gathered with a handful of believers and those that may be surrounded by a thousand believers. Lord, we know that you meet each one of us where we are, not only physically, but also in our faith journey. We are welcome to this table, whether we are filled with doubt and fear and hesitation, or with eagerness and joy. Whatever we bring to this table tonight, may you satisfy our needs. May you fill us up so we no longer hunger. May you quench our thirst. May you allow us to give thanks. And may your spirit prepare us with hope for whatever lies ahead. We ask now that through the Spirit's presence, you allow us to be fully present as we commune with you, with one another, and with all the faithful. We ask this all in the name of our great teacher and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. On that night when our Lord gathered with the faithful, he did just that. He gathered. He called them together. Not individually, but all of his disciples to one place around one table for one meal so that they could truly be the body of Christ together. And it was at that meal, after the singing of familiar songs, after reading the scripture story about the salvation, the freedom given to God's people when they were taken out of bondage and offered the hope of a promised land and a covenantal relationship with their God that would lead to prosperity and safety and a future of freedom. Jesus turned to his disciples. After one had abandoned them to betray him, after many had asked questions and had concerns and doubts, and he grabbed the bread and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Each time you eat of this, you do so in remembrance of me. At that same meal, he poured out the cup and said, this cup is sealed in my blood as a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. And each time you drink of it, you do so, preparing and proclaiming my promised return. This is a meal that not only affirms our current identity as disciples, welcomed and loved by Jesus, but it also affirms and calls us to continue our discipleship journey, knowing that God has a future and has things yet to fulfill and promises that are yet to be fully understood and known and lived into. So there are things for us to do. There's a calling place upon our hearts, and our discipleship journey continues. I invite you now to come to this table and partake.
When you're ready, you're invited forward. this table and you met us here. We are thankful for this time of worship, for the way it reconnects us with you and with one another through the power of your Holy Spirit. May this meal sustain us for the journey of faith that lies ahead. Over the next several days, as Holy Week unfolds, may we be fully present in each moment, reflecting, remembering, giving thanks, and preparing. We ask this all, seeking to be filled with your joy. 
Amen. As the people of God, we acknowledge that we come this evening knowing that God is interested in what we have to say, and what is on our hearts, and what we bring into this holy week. We are reminded that Christians gather across this planet this evening, come to this table to break bread, to share the cup, to give thanks, but we all come from very real individual lives, household lives, community lives, national identities, and just the role of being part of the human family. That brings with us the burdens, and the worries, and the real fears of life, as well as moments of joy and thanksgiving. We as a congregation often lift up our prayer concerns, acknowledging those who are grieving, those who are dealing with health diagnoses that have made them scared and hurt, those that are dealing also at the same time with transitions and travel and change, those that are wrestling with the unknowns of the future, those that have things to celebrate, like good health news, or the birth of new family members, or the celebration of retirement and anniversaries and birthdays. So just as his disciples come to this table with a mix of emotions in the upper room, as their evening starts one way and ends a way they never expected, every day of our lives is like that. Each one of us encountering different things that surprise us or disappoint us, things that make us sad, things that make us happy, reasons to lament and reasons to rejoice in our individual lives and the lives of those we encounter. And we are grateful that no matter who we are or what we bring, God is eager to hear us. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you with the burdens of this world, but also with the joy of your salvation. We are a people who understand that the world is broken because of sin. In this life, if we identify as your disciples, you have offered us a glimpse of heaven, a foretaste of what waits for us in eternal life. You have offered to guide and comfort and be present with us, even in the midst of trouble, temptation, doubt, fear, and persecution. You offer, through the presence of your Holy Spirit, guidance and affirmation, comfort and hope. You also offer us the gift of community, of knowing that fellow disciples walk alongside, ready to lift us up and encourage us, ready to hold us accountable, ready to reaffirm our faith, ready to listen to our testimony. Lord, you also offer us opportunities to share the good news, to tell others, especially this Holy Week, about your ultimate sacrifice, about your willingness to be one of us in the incarnation, to know what it is to be human, to be tempted, yet be without sin. We are grateful for your witness as our Lord, and for the invitation and trust you place upon us through the power of your Holy Spirit to now testify to this most amazing truth. Guide us as your disciples so that we may not disappoint you. Fill us with your spirit and empower us for whatever lies ahead. Allow us to give thanks. Allow us to be fully present in the here and now. Allow us to recognize opportunities to show forth your love and guide us into an amazing future as we await your return. As your disciples, we give thanks and lift our voice together, praying as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And it is not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now as an act of thanksgiving and praise for our time of worship and coming to the table together to stand with me and lift your voice as we sing the hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This?
of prayerful reflection. As we join together in singing, were you there? There's going to be a significant pause in between each verse, at which time parts of our decorations in our sanctuary will be removed in preparation for it to be stark and empty when we then later leave in silence. As you go from this place this evening, after a time of prayer, song, and reflection, may you go knowing the Spirit goes ahead of you. May you be blessed by that Spirit, blessed by God our Father Almighty, and blessed by our Lord and Savior, who willingly died so that each one of us may live forevermore. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we lift our voices in prayerful song.